see it says 2,000? It's probably more than that. The reason I say that is because the first time we recorded 1,200, 200 of it was ours, and 1,000 of it was Irvington. And I've got no idea in the last two or three weeks what Irvington has right. given, but that's, we're right up around $900 now. So there's a, it's right at $2,000 plus. So when I find that total out, I'll let you know, or let John know, and he can mark that up. Amen. John spoke last week. Do you remember what it was on? See, isn't that tough? I do that sometimes. I said, man, the pastor had a good sermon. What do you speak on? It was on Jewish weddings. Huh? Good. Madison Madison. Well, that's because she's young. <laughs> <laughs> she said it on Jewish weddings. Yep. That's exactly what he spoke on. And today, I'm going to speak about ten virgins. I entitled this Burning the Midnight Oil. What well, comes to your mind when I say I'm burning the midnight oil? Working late, staying over. Yeah, working late, staying over. All bad stuff, right? <laughs> extra time, extra effort, extra devotion, or maybe an extra sense of duty. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And that's what the story about the ten virgins is all about. Now, I read a story, and I think I've shared this once before, I read a story written by George Orwell. There you go. You know, in the summer, wasps are everywhere. Do you guys have any wasps at your house? I don't notice them so much around the house. Uh, we've torn out a couple of nests over by the carport. But when you go out to the shed, they like to get under there. And I just know one of these days when John's mowing, He's going to get it. <laughs> I try and keep them killed off, but I noticed last year they were pretty, pretty bad. They build their nests in our houses, under our eave troughs, in our garages. It seems that a wasp flew in and landed on a man's dinner plate. As he was eating his dinner, he saw the wasp. It had landed near a slice of bread that had jam on it. The man didn't like the wasp there eating his jam. So he took his knife and cut the wasp in half. Now I couldn't find this picture of the wasp still eating while he was in half, so that'll have to do. But the wasp was so anxious about eating that it kept doing it. Somehow that insect went on with its meal. The man observed a tiny stream of jam trickling out the end of the severed body. Only when the insect tried to fly away did he grasp the dreadful thing that had happened to him. He couldn't fly. And you know there are a lot of Christians today without Christ that are going to end up just like that wasp. They're dead and they don't know it. They're severed from Christ and kill still consuming the sweetness of this world and they don't realize that they've been separated from eternal life. And only when it's time to fly away will they really realize their dreadful condition. We're lost. We're shut out of the New Jerusalem. The gate is closed. And that's kind of the story of the ten virgins. In Jeremiah chapter 8, it says, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. In this parable of Matthew 25, 1 to 13, and you can follow along in your Bibles, and I thank Lisa for reading that for us this morning. These ten virgins were pure, righteous, undefiled, but the awful thing is that 50% of these virgins were unaware of their lost condition. They didn't realize it. Now they had lamps, and it says that all the lamps were burned. What does a lamp represent? You know this one by heart, you've said this before. It represents the Word of God, the truth of the Bible. In Psalms 119, 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet. A light to my path. 
This story in the Bible illustrates the experience of God's church just prior to the second coming. There are going to be a lot of people that think they're going to be saved and they're actually going to be lost. In uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. In Matthew 25, 2, it says, now five of them were wise and five were foolish. But I want you to notice the similarities between the two this morning. I listed ten, there might be more. All ten dressed in white robes. All ten were virgins. They had a pure faith. All ten had brightly burning lights. All ten waited for Christ to come. They knew it was near. All ten were ready for his coming at one point. All ten slept soundly. All ten had to be awakened with a shout. And all ten were taken by surprise. All ten lamps needed trimmed and filled. And all ten virgins saw the bridal party coming. Now with that many similarities, there wasn't a lot of difference between the ten virgins, were there? They all seemed ready. If there had been no delay, they all would have gone inside because they all had lights in the beginning. But there was a delay, and that is what made the crucial difference. Jesus could have come before now. We should have already been in the Holy City. God's church seems to be in a holding pattern. We're not going anywhere, it seems like, doesn't it? How long, how long have you been in the church, Morris? A long time. And are we still preaching the same thing? Same thing. Same thing. Um, and yet, I want to tell you this morning that just at the time you think maybe he's not coming, that's just the time he'll be right around the corner. I believe Jesus is coming. It's just that close. I told you guys before I talked to Matt, I said, Matt, you need to get back into the church and start studying. I said, the Lord's coming. He said, Dad's been saying that for 30 years. <laughs> and I have. As parents, we do say it a lot, don't we? But notice there are 10 virgins but only two classes, the wise and the foolish. What happened to the lukewarm class we read about in Revelation chapter 3? That's supposed to be the last church, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The lukewarm. Mm -hmm. You would expect there to be two wise, two foolish, and six lukewarm. Mm -hmm. Well, the lukewarm disappeared. In the end of time, there are only the saved and the lost. That's all there ever really was. The lukewarm class disappears because they're shaken out in the last day time, time of trouble and the trials that they have to go through. When the train of salvation finally pulls into the station, we need to make sure we're on the right side of the tracks. You ever heard that saying before? Mm -hmm. When I lived in Arlington, they called me a West Ender. They said, you, you live on the wrong side of the tracks. I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> I had no idea they were looking down their nose at me. <laughs> were the five foolish virgins hypocrites? No. They did love the truth. They all had the light. They all let their light shine. And they all had oil. What was the oil? What does the oil represent? Zechariah 4, 2 through 6 says it represents the Holy Spirit. Did the foolish virgins have the Holy Spirit? Sure they did. All ten had the Holy Spirit. All ten were virgins. All ten were pure Christians. All ten were saved at one point. And all ten 
had brightly shining light. Now what is the light? You've read this before. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So all ten had Jesus. All ten were truly saved, but five ran out of order. They ran out of the Holy Spirit. That seems funny to say that. Mm -hmm. The light of Jesus went out in their life. We've heard that before. They lost their salvation. They were shut out from the wedding banquet and left in darkness. Once you're saved, you can be lost. Now, I know that's not a very popular belief with some. But you can run out of oil if you do not daily invite Christ to restock your heart with a fresh supply of His Holy Spirit. You know, every now and then, I notice that the fridge is getting low. So I need to go to the grocery. And believe it or not, I even have to stop and get gas every now and then. <laughs> we always have to restock. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. Could it be that some of you are wondering about the lamps? Probably you're thinking they were small clay pots with a little wick sticking up out of it. Would that lamp put out enough light for a bridal party? Small lamps would be of little value in the outdoor setting. Scholars have gone over to Palestine and done some research, and actually what they feel is represented or is more like a torch. A long pole with rags tied on the top of the pole, and these rags were soaked in olive oil. And holding that up high provided light for everybody. Such torches consume a lot of oil. That little lamp that you might be thinking about can last for hours and hours without refilling. But the big torches have to be refilled every 15 or 20 minutes. So that gives you some idea how much time we need to be in the Lord of God. Now the oil is abundant. All of us can be filled with God's Holy Spirit. There is no energy crisis in heaven. And how much will it cost you? It's free. Yet, you talk to a lot of people and they say, I have to give up everything. Jesus wants a full surrender. He doesn't want a half-hearted religion, a half-hearted surrender. You can't keep one foot in the world and one foot in the church. That's just not the way it works. In Matthew 25, 4, it says, The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their land. The wise had reserve oil. And what that means, at least to me, is they had a deeper experience with Christ. It wasn't shallow. The wise virgins had a depth of spirituality not experienced by the foolish virgins. And I believe that in the last day, the people that are going to be saved are going to have a deep religious experience with Jesus. Not just one of those super official experiences. This is one I learned when I was a child. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord of my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord of my soul to keep. We need a little bit more depth in our prayer than that. <laughs> Amen. We need a deep Bible understanding. We need a depth of Christianity that we might not now have. Extra prayer goes into building a solid character. And we need a deep relationship with Jesus. Matthew 25, 5 says, The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. He delayed his coming. They thought he would be there before now, but he wasn't. The King James Version says, All slumbered and slept. They were all tired. You guys ever put on a wedding? Oh my. Matt, Matt and Danielle got married last year. 
You know, wedding would wear you out. Even the practice would wear you out. There's a lot that goes into a wedding. They had spent many hours preparing for the coming of the bridegroom. They were all asleep at the bride's house, waiting for the groom to come. Even the very elect were sleeping because of the delay. Could it be that you're sleeping? Are you spiritually asleep this morning? Are you sleeping while the King of Kings is about to arrive? True, there has been a delay, but some of you thought you would never have time to get married, and now you have grandchildren. Did any of you ever feel that way? Mm -hmm. I remember coming in the church, I had kids, and I believed the Lord was coming soon, and I thought, well, I'll never see your grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 25 6 says at midnight the cry rang out here is the bridegroom come out to meet him the bridegroom comes at midnight the darkest time of the night we're told that the second coming of Jesus will come during the darkest period of earth's history and I believe it's closer than we think in fact, you can see it coming with all the terrible things that are going on out there in the world. You see crimes, drugs, immorality, sin, and wickedness are at their peak, and the end of all things will come crashing down. Matthew 25, 7 says, Then all the virgins woke up at the midnight cry and turned their lamps. Now, the Bible doesn't say it's a midnight cry, I put that in. They needed to replenish their lamps with oil. They needed to burn the midnight oil. We also need to burn the midnight oil. If we're planning on being saved, I think there's no time to waste. Now, can you find oil at midnight? There are stations that stay open 24 hours, but have you ever run out of gasoline? <laughs> yeah, generally that's a long, dark walk. <laughs> All ten virgins had run out of oil in their torches, but the wise had spare reserves of oil. What is that extra oil? I think it was an extra measure of the presence of God in their life. It's a depth of religion that is hard to find these days, and that's what we need because it will carry us through. We need to be people of the Bible. You know, they took a survey of Adventist students at the seminary and asked them to write out the Ten Commandments. Do you know how many of them got it right? Very few. Only two out of ten. Only two out of ten were able to get it right. Now, could you write out the Ten Commandments? I think I can tell you what they are, but I don't know if word for word. We need to be people of the Bible. Matthew 25, 8 says, The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Mm -hmm. But what did the wise virgin say? Sure, glad to. <laughs> <laughs> no. In verse 9 they said, No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy some for yourselves. Actually, you can't share oil, at least not this oil. Can you give anyone else your Christian experience? Some of us would like to, but you can't. You can't save somebody else. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But it's true. You can lead them to water, but you can't make them drink. You can share the gospel, but they have to make the commitment. You can't transfer the saving experience that you have to your wife or your husband or your kids, even as much as you'd like to. Christianity cannot be transferred or sold. Each must get the saving oil straight from the source. The wise virgins could not transfer their saving experience to the foolish. Character is not transferable. They couldn't share the oil, but you can share Christ. And I uh, 
passive please do that. No one can be a Christian for you. Not your parents, not your loved ones, not your kids. Are you a Christian? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Are you ready for Jesus to come? By the way, did they find oil that night? Matthew 25, 10 to 12 says, But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the also came, and others came, and said, Sir, sir, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know. Did the five foolish virgins find oil at midnight? No. Christ's Object Lessons, page 406, says they were left standing outside in the empty street in the blackness of the night. After probation is closed, the Holy Spirit is no longer there. After the time of trouble really begins in earnest and the plagues are falling, do you think there will be time to develop a Christian experience? There will come a time when it's too late to seek salvation. If you wait until the time of trouble or some end time event that you've read about in the Bible, I think you've probably waited too long. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6 2, now is the day of salvation. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. <laughs> Today is the day that you need to make your life right with Christ. How is it with you today? Is your light getting dim? Is your light beginning to flicker? Is your walk with Jesus lacking or non-existent? Or are you satisfied to live without a Savior? As your brother in Christ, I want you to know we're going to need a Christian experience that we might not now have. And we need to make changes so that we'll be ready when the Lord comes. I think as Christians we cannot be satisfied with minimal Bible study, minimal prayer time, or half-hearted relationship. Now is the time to have a full experience with Jesus. Empty tank Christianity will leave you stranded just like an empty gas tank will. Matthew 25, 13 says, Therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. And we don't. That's kind of how our church got started when we thought the Lord was coming in 1844. And I say we because it was Adventist followers that went after that. But at the time... It was the Millerite movement. And Miller was a Methodist. Of course, they don't take any credit for it now. But. <laughs> so, but we don't know the time of Christ's arrival. We know it's soon, but we don't know when. Someday soon, Jesus will come in the clouds of glory. If the lamp of God's word burns bright in your heart, you'll get to go home. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, <coughs> it says, Many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. I told someone this morning I was going to share John 3, 17. We all know John 3, 16, don't we? Mm -hmm. Do you know what 17 says? For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Amen.